the sustainability towards the sustainability of the African network of PMOs and reiterate our commitment to host the network and provide technical and administrative support to its engagement. The African Parliamentary Press Network, APPN, which is made up of journalists reporting from various parliaments across Africa, has also been initiated and is hosted by us from our Accra office to ensure that members of the fourth estate who report from various national and regional parliaments in Africa, including the Pan-African Parliament, are equipped with the necessary skills and the freedoms protected to effectively promote access to parliamentary information across the continent. We are very willing to work with you, our distinguished invitees and partners in promoting all of this. To David uh, Peterson, Senior Director for African Programs at NED and his team, we wish to thank you for making time to join us today and for your continuous support, interest, and for your continuous interest in this project and initiatives on the continent. To everybody else, we trust that you'll be able to share your thoughts and provide feedback to us on this project throughout today's event and beyond. Once again, thank you very much for making time to join us. And as uh, most of us here in Ghana say, Akwaba. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you very much. Okay, so it's only fair that we hear some opening remarks from the founder himself. Um, so I welcome Mr. Dave Peterson, who is the Senior Director of the Africa Program of the National Endowment for Democracy. Since 1988, Mr. Dave has been responsible for NES program to identify and assist hundreds of African NGOs and activists working for democracy, human rights, free press, justice, and peace. Thank you, Ned, and thank you very much for funding us. Uh, we need to hear some opening remarks from you. So, Mr. Dave, the floor is yours now. Well, uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. It really is a pleasure for me to uh, be able to uh, offer some uh, welcoming remarks. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy is just uh, very, very pleased and proud uh, to be able to support the parliamentary network uh, on this uh, great uh, initiative. Uh, I think it's uh, going to really contribute to strengthening um, uh, democracy and uh, the uh, legislatures uh, across West Africa. And so um, I will be uh, following uh, uh, your activities uh, with uh, great interest, uh, and um, I wish you, uh, you know, good luck uh, with uh, today's uh, conference. Um, unfortunately, uh, I have a very important meeting that I have to uh, dash off to uh, right now, but I do hope to return a little bit later uh, to um, uh, participate and in, 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 uh, uh, observe um, uh, the meeting a little bit later today, but uh, for now, uh, just uh, please um, uh, congratulations and uh, I look forward to uh, the great work that I know you'll be doing. Thank you very much. And we will surely send you the recording of this meeting so that you can have access to everything, even in your absence. I will definitely look forward. To it. Thank you so much. Thank you too. Okay. Goodbye. All right. Bye. So next on the agenda is happening some talks on the project itself. So we need to hear from the project manager, Mr. Benjamin Opokuaye. Good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Opokwaye. Um, as the lead servant on this project, I'm here to do a few things. I'm just going to 
So I'm just going to make us understand, or I'm going to show how, I'm going to show what this project is about. I'm going to show what this project is about. What do we mean by open West Africa, uh, open, par open parliamentary engagement and networking in Africa, in West Africa. We are also going to look at why do we need to implement this project? And especially at this time, why do we need to be doing this at this time? We're also going to understand how we are going to implement this project. And then of course, we'll finally get to know for us in this room and for those of us on the call, how do we get to be involved? How do we partner? How do we come on board this project so that we are part of the success story in the end of the implementation? So in 2011, there was a global conference of PMOs. There was a global conference of parliamentary monitoring organizations. And then what this meeting sought to do was to understand in the context of global PMO community, what PMOs do, what categories of PMOs we have, what are some of the challenges that they face in their operations. So, an outcome of this meeting was that NDI and then the World Bank Institute commissioned a report. And so this research report or this study made some few recommendations. One of the recommendations was the fact that PMOs needed support in the work that they are doing. They needed to come together to build common tools to share ideas, to learn the lessons from each other. Again, another recommendation that came out of the survey was the fact that PMOs needed support, funding to be, do, to be doing what they do as PMOs. From the same meeting, another conversation erupted. So it came out that um, CDD in 2014 was also commissioned with the support of OSIWA to undertake a study. And again, for this particular study, you would realize that for the first study, which was a global study, it only took into consideration the global perspective of what PMOs are and what they do. But with a second study that CDD undertook, it's concentrated on Africa. So this study was about African PMOs. And the focus of this study was to map out the PMOs, the various PMOs that we have on the continent the kind of operations that they do, the kind of work they do, what are some of the challenges they face, and a number of other things. Out of this survey also, there were some few recommendations. One of them was the fact that the survey identified that, yes, there were cordial relationship between PMOs and their parliament, but even apart from that, or even despite the cordial relationship they have with their parliament, having access to information from parliament is very difficult. Imagine a PMO who works with parliament, who monitors parliament and wants or needs information from parliament, yet does not have access to such information. It means definitely their work will be affected. A second recommendation, and for this recommendation and for us at PN Africa, it's one that we hold very dear to. This recommendation suggested that PMOs on the continent share similar challenges in their activities, in their monitoring work, their uh, research work. In fact, PMOs have similar characteristics, if you would allow me. 
And so the report uh, suggested that despite these similar activities, these similar, uh, say, operations and all of that, there is no common platform or there is no network for these PMOs to share these experiences, to engage each other, to learn from whatever their, their, their colleagues are doing from other countries and all of that. And it identified it as a very big problem because if we are able to come together as a community, as PMOs, then we will definitely be able to have a fair knowledge of what each of us are doing in that community. And so it is based on this particular problem that for us at PN Africa, we feel the need to be implementing this project, which is the Open Parliament Engagement and Networking in West Africa, for short, Open West Africa. This project covers the whole of West Africa. We have 15 countries, and of course, as mentioned earlier, over 60% of the countries in West Africa are Francophone, uh, Francophone speaking of Francophone countries. We are going to cover the whole of West Africa as the name suggests, uh, Open West Africa. Again, on this project, we are going to engage the two regional parliaments that we have. We are going to engage the ECOWAS parliament. We are going to engage the Pan-African parliament. We'll get to know or understand more about, we'll, we'll understand more about how that engagement is going to be. Can I move on? So here, yeah, the activities that we are going to implement and for each of these activities, we have them under two major objectives. The first of these objectives is to facilitate networking among PMOs in West Africa. So what this project is going to do is to provide that platform, that common platform for PMOs to share ideas, to share lessons, to learn from each other. If you are doing something in your home country, we provide that common platform for you to engage each other. If there are any challenges, you are able to learn from what or how a partner or how another PMO has solved that particular issue. So we are going to do that and under these, First activity we want to implement is to create and run an online parliamentary resource hub. What we are basically going to do is to provide that go-to repository of uh, knowledge online, a repository of knowledge where we can all go or PMOs can visit, have access to resources, download, they can also upload their experiences, they can also upload their lessons, whatever they have for the PMO community that they wish to put on there, they are able to upload and put them there so that any other PMO can as well visit the portal and download and have access to these resources. The second activity we want to implement is to organize networking and learning workshops for PMOs in West Africa. So we are basically going to organize workshops and these workshops will take the form of hybrid where we would engage partners in the various countries that will be having these, uh, these workshops. And then it also opens up to other community or other countries online to join in. So we are basically going to allow, or we are going to provide a platform for PMOs to learn, to build their capacity, to share knowledge and information to them, to help them understand their area of work better, 
to help them overcome some of the challenges that they are going through. And of course, we are going to invite experts to share very critical knowledge for the PMO community. And at the second objective of this project, this objective is to strengthen parliamentary openness across national and regional legislatures in West Africa. So basically what we are going to do to achieve this objective is to take the journey to the various national parliaments that we have in West Africa. So we are going to engage the national parliament. And as I mentioned earlier, we're also going to engage the regional parliament, the ECOWAS and Pan-African parliament. So specifically for the first activity, we want to monitor and engage the ECOWAS and Pan-African parliament. And to do this is, uh, 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 if I would say, the, our, our brothers African parliamentary press network. So they are going to, monitor these two regional parliaments, the ECOWAS and Pan-African parliaments, and they are going to monitor their practices, their procedures, their activities, everything they do as a parliament. And this information is to help us on this project to understand how these parliaments operate and also to help us identify any of the uh, procedural lapses that we may want to help them change or revise perhaps these lapses or these uh, procedural change challenges are those that do not allow them to be transparent, do not allow them to be very accountable and to, do not allow them to open up to the African citizens. So we want to look at how best we can engage them. Secondly, we also want to develop and launch a legislative transparency index. So this is going to be a tool that is going to assess the general performance or assess the general level of openness in national parliaments. So for each parliament, how are they doing with transparency? How are they doing with accountability, responsiveness, what's the level of their responsiveness to the needs of citizens? How are they including citizens in their, in their work? And how, how are citizens on the continent even able to, to have access or to be part of the deliberations of these parliaments? We want to consider all of that. And we, we, we are going to draw a lot of inspirations from the interparliament, the standards as published by the interparliamentary union. We are also going to look at the principles of parliamentary openness. Of course, we are going to look at the standards of the OGP community, the open government partnership. And then finally, for, for our, our, our friends in Argentina, we are going to take a lot of inspiration from the Latin American Legislative Transparency Index that is going to help us to do this. So the findings or the publication of this index is what we are going to use to engage the national parliament and the regional parliament as to how they've done or how they are faring on the level of transparency, their level of accountability and all of that so that we are able to engage the systems and the procedures that they operate with if there are any lapses that we identify, any challenges, we have that conversation, we have that engagement with the MPs, the leaders of these parliaments to see how best we can chart a course and see how best we can improve transparency or the general parliamentary openness. So just to share some few examples or some few lessons that, um, we've had as a PMO network in Ghana. As, as you may be aware, um, the, P, the Ghana PMO network has been in existence for some time. If we were to be in business, we would say we are still in the nurturing stage. But even in our nurturing stage, 
There are a lot that we've done, we've been able to achieve, and just to share some few of them in pictures. So currently we have about 20 members. We have 20 members, 20 CSOs. We have 20 CSOs, combined CSOs and PMOs, and some of these CSOs work on issues of governance. Some of them work on issues of women and gender. Some of them on environment, climate. Some of them on education, health, sanitation. We also have some private representation as well. So you could see how, how a network like this have that general representation of the society so that if you want to engage parliament with this particular network, then you know that you are fairly representation of the, the society who can engage and who have the expertise to engage parliament. We have an active online platform that we use for learning and networking. We share resources also on this platform. We have a WhatsApp platform. We have a Google groups that we share information and we also learn a lot. The first picture was when we, we uh, it, it was the inception meeting for the Ghana PMOs network when the network was founded. So you could see where members were discussing, were, were making contributions on strategy and how to push the agenda forward. The second picture, you would see an engagement with CSOs on open parliament principles and standing orders of parliament. Now, it's always necessary for us to even as PMOs or as organizations who work with parliaments, it's necessary for us to understand the principles that we are working with. I mean, from, from the two research that, or the two studies that uh, I mentioned or I discussed, when you, when you are able to read the, the whole report, it comes out clearly that even in or during the research, it was identified that even with PMOs who are supposed to understand the principles of parliamentary openness and be able to engage parliaments very well, the understanding of these principles were very low. So then it calls for uh, the urgent need for us to engage PMOs. And so for Ghana, we thought it wise to engage the, the CSOs community to give them that knowledge and understanding of the principles that we have. And then also in same event, we took the opportunity to engage on the standing orders of parliament. So around this time, parliament is looking to revise uh, its procedures. It's looking to revise the standing orders. And so as PMOs or as CSOs, we thought it wise to make some contributions. So we came together, we've had that discussion as a network. And of course, we made, we've made that recommendation. We've made a lot of recommendations to the Speaker of Parliament. He has received it. And so it is our hope that the final um, standing order that comes out or the final publication will have our recommendations in it, which of course um, is geared towards enhancing transparency, accountability, and inclusiveness. As a network, we've also been able to engage a number of committees in Parliament. We've been able to engage, for instance, the Employment, Social Welfare, and State Enterprises Committee. We've been able to engage the Poverty Reduction Committee. And we've been able to engage the Gender and Children Committee. Now, what, what, what we are able to do in these meetings is to engage the leadership of these committees to understand their work, to understand what, what they do, what the agenda is for a particular session of parliament and to see how best we can help them as a community of PMOs, as a network who have at our disposal um, a lot of experience, a lot of expertise. So it's always wise or it's always right to engage parliament to help them with these expertise. 
to help them with these experiences so that it, it moves forward the work that these committees who are very critical to the work of parliament do in there. And then for the final engagement was with the open parliament tax team of Ghana's parliament. So this tax team is the team that ensures or advances the open parliament principles in parliament. So if you want to talk about how the Ghana parliament is doing in terms of transparency, in terms of accountability, in terms of inclusiveness, this team is supposed to see to it that the principles of parliamentary openness are very clear in the practices and procedures of parliament so that at all times, we can assess or at all times you can monitor the progress. So we engage this particular task team to understand their work and what plans they have for promoting open parliament in the Ghana parliament. So that is the engagement that we have a lot of CSOs in there. Now, this is where we want to know how we, we can get involved as partners, as, as members of the PMO community. How do we get involved in this whole project or this whole engagement? So I mentioned earlier that we will be engaging in several countries, several national, we'll be engaging in several national parliaments and each of these countries, what we are going to do is to engage partners Right, we are going to engage partner CSOs. We are going to engage. So the, the idea is for us to be able to encourage our colleagues in other countries to also convene or to also form that community of PMOs to be able to engage their national parliament. And for us in Ghana, as we, we've had a, a number of experience, we hope to share these experiences with them. And we hope to encourage them because, of course, we identify that we have very diverse uh, context. Um, the Francophone countries are very diverse context. Uh, the Anglophone as well. So sometimes it's it's, it's not that easy to just um, pick lessons from one country and expect that it works in the other. But then we are going to see how best it will fit into each uh, country's context. So we are going to see how best we can also support them to mobilize around all of these issues around open parliament and how they can engage. And then finally, for us at PN Africa, we, we deem this a great opportunity and we thank NET for giving this support from the previous reports one of the challenges, of course, was the fact that PMOs lacked funding. And so out of that, the recommendation was also that we made funding available to PMOs to advance their operations. And so if NED is supporting this project, then we are very grateful. And it only shows how NED is committed to advancing democracy on the continent. And so for us, we are very grateful for that. Okay, and then finally, I want to thank you for paying attention and listening to me. Thank you very much. Hello. Okay, thank you very much, Ben. Um, So um, I hope during his presentations, we noted our questions down because I'm sure those questions will be uh, answered during the panel discussion. And I am sure that by now we are all clear on what the project is about, the scope, the objective, and the, the things and why we actually want to embark on this project. So I now hand over to our executive director who is going to moderate the next session. So my work here is currently done. So Mr. Samir Obin, please take over. Please let's welcome him.
Good. Thank you very much, Cynthia. I think that um, we can continue from here with uh, a hybrid panel discussion where we are going to have some of our uh, panel members online while we have some of our panel members also seated in here. And so uh, fortunately we have them uh, uh, pinned out there when they get introduced and they enable their videos, we'll be able to uh, see them even as they participate in this virtual panel discussion. As I have been introduced, my name is Sami Obeng. I work with Parliamentary Network Africa. Um, as Ben made his presentation over the period, we noticed that there are some very key highlights of the Open Parliament Engagement and Networking uh, in West Africa project, the Open West Africa project. And the highlights being connecting PMOs and uh, organizations that engage national parliaments in respective countries in West Africa, launching an Open Parliament Index, uh, to be able to measure the level of openness of uh, parliaments across West Africa, uh, and then also having a parliamentary resource hub that will have you know, uh, uh, knowledge materials and, and exchanges between uh, parliamentary monitoring organizations and parliamentary engagement organizations across uh, the continent of West Africa. And to be able to bring a, a continental perspective to this, because we do not expect that the lessons and learnings from this would only be enjoyed by those of us who are um, on, who are in West Africa alone, because this fits broadly into the Open Africa initiative of PN Africa, which is seeking to engage and network broadly among civil society organizations that engage national parliaments across the continent of Africa. So to join me in today's um, panel discussion, being mindful also of the fact that as we go ahead, those of you who are online, you can be able to put your questions online. Those who are here with us, you would have the opportunity to also ask your questions so that we can all share some ideas on how to go about this. Joining me online, uh, we have our friends from the Eastern African region, um, a very good friend of PN Africa, partner organization that we've been working very much with. Uh, they are a Kenyan-based parliamentary monitoring organization called Zelendo Trust, and its executive director, Caroline Gaita, is on here with us. Caroline, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sammy. Honored to be here and to awesome. engage with you from Nairobi. Santi. Awesome. Um, also joining us from the Southern African region is one of the other leading parliamentary monitoring organizations in South Africa uh, with its executive director, Rashad Ali, and that's the parliamentary monitoring group, PMG. Rashad, welcome. Hi, good day, colleagues. Pleased to be here. Awesome. Now, beyond the continent of Africa, we also have um, the Latin American region um, or continent, which when it comes to matters relating to civil society networking to be able to engage parliament has pioneered, you know, and played a very major role in that particular uh, effort. So from Argentina, we have Maria Baron, who is the Global Executive Director for Directorio Legislativo. Directorio Legislativo is a PMO of many years standing that actually also coordinates the Latin America Legislative Transparency Network and has been working closely with its partners to initiate the legislative index, legislative transparency index that measures parliaments in the Latin American area. Maria, thank you so very much and welcome. Thank you so much, Sami, and thank you a lot for the invitation. It's an honor for us to always uh, engage with you and with the colleagues that are part of this, this panel, Caroline and uh, Rash Rashad. Um, thanks a lot. And I hope we, ha we have an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. So for, for, for those of us who may not be aware, Maria also happens to be the global co-chair of the Open Governance Partnership, OGP, um, 
um, across the, the civil society co-chair of OGP across the globe. We, uh, we had Bonolo, uh, Bonolo Magale is from the Pan-African Parliament Civil Society Forum, uh, which is based in South Africa and within the Center for Human Rights uh, of the University of Pretoria. Bonolo is actually on an election observation mission in Zambia, and so her connection keeps going, going off. But once Bonolo joins us, rejoins us again, she would also be on the panel. So Rashad, Caroline, and Maria will be our panel members online. But offline, we are going to also have two persons who will be joining me here to be able to add up to the conversation. On the, in the West African region, uh, one of the leading PMOs or organizations that have pioneered the work of PMOs uh, over the years, and as was mentioned in the presentation by Amanda and Ben, has been the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana. Now, this is because as far back as 2014, 2015, CDD Ghana convened the Africa PMOs Network uh, Conference uh, with a baseline report that also checked on how PMOs are doing on, in the West African uh, 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 sub ranges specifically, but more broadly the continent, and more recently convened the West Africa Parliamentary Monitoring Organizations Conference, which has constituted and started the engine for the uh, advancement of a West Africa Parliamentary Monitoring Organizations Network. And representing CDD here to be able to provide some perspective is um, a research officer at CDD, Newton, Novia, Newton, please join me here. A round of applause for Newton as he comes. And then also, as was mentioned severally in the presentations that were made, uh, we do not intend to advance this project without the involvement, the strong involvement of the media, you know, in all of this. And as you may be aware, the African Parliamentary Press Network is one of those initiatives that is hosted within Parliamentary Network Africa. And uh, it has what we call um, country caucuses uh, in their respective African countries with journalists who report from their respective parliaments. At the moment, well over 100 journalists who report from various African parliaments are actually on the African Parliamentary Press Network platform. And uh, we'll have a member of the steering committee of the African Parliamentary Press Network who also happens to be the team leader for the network uh, here in Ghana. Uh, Mr. Clement Akolo, who also happens to be a parliamentary reporter at the Parliament of Ghana. A round of applause for Clement. So with our guests set and with the project concepts and description already given to us from the presentation by Ben, welcome Clement, welcome Newton. We would go straight into picking the introductory remarks from the um, respective colleagues who are joining us on the panel, of course, from their respective perspectives. Um, and before we even get specifically onto the African continent, I want to start with Maria. Maria, for the past 10 years, uh, you and your colleagues at Directorial Legislativo have pioneered the Latin American network of PMOs have published several editions of the um, Legislative Transparency Index, uh, seeing that this is starting to build on the momentum that has already been initiated in Africa. What will be your introductory words hearing about the Open West Africa project that has been you know, presented? Maria. Thank you, Ben, for giving me the floor. Um... As you and, and thank you, uh, sorry, Sami, and thank you, Ben, uh, for the introductory remarks where he framed uh, where this will be sort of situated uh, between all of the initiatives that you will take forward because it really makes sense. And a lot of the needs that he reflected in his remarks uh, are really the same needs or very similar needs that we have and had in Latin America when we started uh, this initiative, creating the network and within the network, having this assessment tool to sort of um, base our advocacy work in evidence. 
and I'm sure you you feel the same way in uh, our um, countries. We many times when we talk about transparency, sort of it's there's no concrete facts rather than do this you know, asking the government or the parliament to do a specific thing, the parliament or the government reacting in, in a way where there's no facts, no a tangible um, a conversation to, to base it. And this was the first um, interest in creating this tool. So in a way, I'm, I'm gonna talk and very succinctly about uh, sort of putting together the network at the same time where we put together this assessment tool that we call the Latin American um, Legislative Transparency Index. Um, and so uh, this, like you mentioned, we put it together uh, in 2011. And so the first assessment was in uh, 2012. So that means that this year, 2022, one, uh, we're going to do the sixth measurement. And uh, the first, uh, the first measurement was done only in five countries. Now we're doing it in thirteen. Um, but um, sort of, th there are a million of lessons. Like we talked bilaterally many times, there are a million of lessons that we uh, learn from ourselves, uh, and that maybe we can share. Uh, with you so that you don't follow the same steps uh, that are um, in a way uh, uh, the, the things that we did uh, with good intentions but not so well at the beginning. So I, I think I would um, underline maybe three uh, just to share in this conversation three um, uh, lessons or three um, points that are or have been really, really relevant for us in Latin America. And maybe you can uh, find in those um, 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 a, a reflection into uh, thinking uh, while you build this in, in, in your region. So the first is, uh, is the first lesson of the network itself that really reflected in the um, in the assessment tool as well, which is the creation of the network not only allowed us to work regionally together as organizations and have one voice today after uh, almost 10 years or maybe so the, the network was created in yeah 10, 10 years, 10, 11 years, uh, we find that we have one voice and that one voice is really relevant for the different conversations that are happening in the world. And so we get called to create the benchmarks, we get called to create an engagement policy, we get called to sort of participate in what and how uh, should uh, you know, the different uh, documents or the different initiatives how they should go forward. So that uh, as, a, as a network has been really, really fruitful and has given us an advocacy sort of muscle that we didn't think we had at the beginning. So that, uh, to, just to underline, one voice. Um, of course, we, we've talked about this. We have a governance system, which we have professionalized it or changed it uh, and formalized it throughout the years, which is really good. And we can exchange about that too. But then I want to um, talk about what, uh, what I was saying originally. So the network not only strengthened and made us have one voice, not only in Latin America, but in the world, but also it strengthened the national sort of mini networks the networks within each of our countries. So for example, in Argentina, we had four organizations that joined originally that not all worked together at, at that time. Today, everything we do work or advocate towards the parliament, we do it together. So that network, like the local sort of network, helped us also to have one voice, but at the national level. 
not only regional or global, but also national. So that I think is something to underline. Going to the, to the index specifically, I, I would say three uh, sort of lessons uh, or con uh, positive quest, um, consequences that we've had. The first one is it gave us a sort of baseline of where we were at in terms of transparency in our parliaments. And this, this was uh, really relevant to going to what I was saying earlier, uh, to base our arguments and our, our advocacy efforts in data. Do we have this specific bill and does this specific bill or, or law, does this specific prerogative decision, whatever, work or not? So um, uh, the first goal, evidence-based arguments and efforts. Second, uh, of course, and, and on the, in this first issue, of course, there's a lot of uh, in the um, in the parliaments the, in the parliaments or parliamentary actors. There's a lot of discussion. Is the methodology that we use to measure the transparency in each of the parliaments is the correct one or not? We always say it can be this. Um, method methodology or it can be another one but the fact is that this law or this initiative you don't have it or it doesn't work that doesn't change the fact that the findings are really really and this is a second um, point that I wanted to make doesn't change the fact that the data that this assessment tool brings is really concrete if you look at the answers of each of the countries and you are the parliament or the decision maker in each of the parliaments, you can go to the assessment tool results and you can change whatever you want in, that, in, in, the, in the parliament itself. So it's very, either you have it or you don't have it. Does it apply well or it's, it's not applied well? It's very, if there's political will or political intention of changing and uh, making uh, transparency deeper in each of the parliaments, you can really, really um, make it by looking at the results. Um, so you can change, of, uh, so the index is composed of four dimensions and each dimen dimension has a set of variables. In total, there are more than 200 variables. So if you want, and you're a parliament that wants to change things, you can look at all the variables, change it, and then wait until the next measurement. And then you go uh, most of the times uh, up in the percentage of the 100% um, uh, of the willingness to have transparency or not. And the third is the, uh, like I said before, the need for us as organizations and advocacy, specifically advocacy organizations, to have a conversation with the parliament that is evidence-based. So the, the three points, baseline of data, of, and then the, over, the evolution of that. The second is it allows you for change and reform that is easily to change in the sense that it's easily it's easy to see the problem and the third evidence based conversation. One thing that after and, and with this I'll finish my my reflection. And um, with one thing that we have talked uh, many times with the organizations in in Latin America and a conversation that is ongoing in my organization specifically is how can we frame all the results that are needed and that come out if of an index like this. And uh, of course, I'll bring in to this, the OGP uh, approach to what we call open parliament and um, uh, a framing of, of, or how to create commitments uh, that can be framed in an open parliament plan. Uh, what we came up is, all of the results of the indexes that need change can be framed in an open parliament plan. And in that way, uh, 
there is a more formal approach to all of the needs that um, result from the measurement. So it can be really concrete. So you can see the measurement, you can see the needs, you can put them together in an open parliament plan, co-create it with the parliament itself. And for that, you have usually two, one and a half or two years to implement uh, the, um, uh, the commitments that you put in the action plan with the parliament. So with that, that is sort of the, uh, uh, an interesting sort of 360 approach to open parliament. So you have a network, the network creates an index, the index creates results, you see the needs, that uh, come out of those results, put them together in an action plan, co-create it with the parliament itself, and then go ahead and implement them. So if you have that 360 approach in a way, um, it could be a really uh, good way to um, um, approach uh, the, the, the need that all of the, um, the parliaments have or all of, all of the organizations that work in open parliament have an agenda that is pending and put it together, frame it and make it happen. So just with that, of course, there, there are a lot of um, needs and a, and a lot of challenges from this, but it's something that we're testing or that we have been testing in Latin America for many, many years. And in some countries, uh, it has uh, given us very, uh, nice results. So just to share that uh, and to add to that, to all of the efforts that all of the different countries, national and regionally you're doing in, in, in Africa. So thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Maria, as always, uh, for sharing these amazing insights with us. And just uh, um, so that we all know that PN Africa has actually been working with Maria and the team at Directorial Legislativo for the past uh, year or so, you know, to be able to help provide some technical assistance on developing this learning from the experiences from the Latin America region over the past uh, uh, 10 years. And the angle on how a network makes us stronger how the index brings the benefit of you know, a baseline which can be measured against future progress uh, and can serve as a concrete data for advocacy and how we bring in the OGP angle uh, to be able to co-create open parliament action plans in a, what you described as a 360 degree approach uh, you know, makes for an interesting combination. Thank you as always, Maria, for sharing those insights with us. So from Buenos Aires, when Maria is based, we'll come down here to West Africa. Uh, Newton will share with us uh, some perspectives from CDD's work over the years uh, within the West African region, specifically pioneering the earlier PMO conference in Africa, and of course the recent West African one, uh, by sharing some reflections on that particular angle. He'll do that uh, uh, within a couple minutes, and then I will uh, move straight to uh, Caroline, and of course to Rashad, who would be giving us their perspectives as colleagues who we are working with, you know, uh, based in the other regions of Africa on how we can all work together, you know, towards making this, you know, sustainable going forward. So Newton. Thank you, Sami. Um, so greetings. CDD is, is happy to be part of this success story of, of PMOs being recognized on the African continent. Um, I must say that indeed, Africa is largely considered as the, the dark planet, mainly because there is a lot happening yet. We are not highlighting these things. And so uh, the opening remarks had already talked about some of the things we've done, our participation in the global conference where, we, where, it, was, where it was communicated that there's very little uh, work of PMOs on the continent but uh, like I indicated, we are proud to be part of this success story and highlighting the work of PMOs. Uh, over the years, CDD Ghana has engaged various regional, re various regional um, bodies, including the East Africa uh, Legislative Assembly, the SADC, uh, West Africa and, and the Pan-African Parliament. And with, with all these activities, we managed to bring together 
PMOs or organizations that work in, in monitoring the work of parliament to, to set up the PMO Africa. Oh, and again, we also noticed that within the African continent, there are also sub uh, PMO networks. And this was absent in West Africa. So uh, a couple of months ago, CDD again engaged organizations, PMOs that are within the West African region to set up a West African parliamentary monitoring organization network. And we are proud to know that whilst our project is ending, uh, PN Africa is, is positioning itself to continue this um, project. So what I would want to share as, as best practices or lessons learned uh, during the implementation of our project. So it feeds into what PN Africa is uh, getting ready to, to take over. And first of all, I must say that uh, there's, there's some of the activities that have been planned for this project uh, directly speak to some of our initial findings and some of the challenges that PMOs on the continent have been facing. Particularly, I would want to talk about the index for assessing uh, parliamentary openness. This is very important because in our, in our baseline, we, we ask the question about how do you determine if a parliament is open? Uh, in, in Francophone West Africa, for instance, where we have different systems of parliament and then Anglophone, uh, uh, and Anglophone parliament as well. We, we realize that there are quite some differences. So how do you determine if a, parli if a parliament is open in the first place? So being able to come up with an index that takes into consideration a specific co country context is one that uh, speaks directly to how we need to move forward as a group. And then also having a resource hub to share some of our findings, if, if there are PMOs doing different things that are not you know, known to the larger network, there is a need to be able to put this information uh, and make them available to others. And then continuous capacity building because uh, baseline identified beyond external uh, challenges, PMOs also have internal challenges. Many of them don't know how to engage parliament. They don't understand uh, uh, parliament processes in their timelines. And so these are things that continually we have to, con we have to be building. But more specific to uh, some of the best practices, uh, we can talk about closer collaboration and partnerships with other uh, PMOs. So we, in, in, a, in, a, in the last conference we had, for instance, it was clear that some PMOs have comparative advantage when it comes to IC, the use of ICT, for instance. And so these are some of the things we need to be looking out for and then positioning member, member organizations uh, to take up lead role when there is a need and not act as, uh, you know, uh, being able to, to do all. And this would as well enhance our own reach in the various areas that we, we have a comparative advantage in. We, we can also talk about, so in, in a baseline finding, we also identified that uh, parliament and PMOs have mutual suspicion of each other. And so parliament is, is, will be asking the question about where do you get your mandate to be monitoring me? And why even monitoring me in the first place? Uh, PMOs would also tell you we are citizens, a citizen group, and we have every right to be interested in the work of parliament. Uh, to, to, to diffuse some of this tension between PMOs and, and parliament, uh, there is the need to, to meet each other, particularly where we identify uh, challenges or, or, or capacity, capacity gaps. So some PMOs have that advantage as I've already talked about. Uh, how do we use these advantages uh, to complement the work of parliament? How do we provide the knowledge that we have uh, to, to augment the work of, of parliamentarians? We've seen examples in, in other parts of Africa where 
some, some PMOs set up desk, particularly to, to support members of parliament in drafting uh, policy. And so, and so these are some of the, the actions that PMOs can take beyond uh, the consistent and persistent uh, monitoring of the work of parliament. We can lend the capacity, some of the capacity that we have to, to members of parliament and, 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 and parliament as a, as, as a whole, so that we diffuse this, this tension. Also, we realize, we realize that uh, the, the, the declaration of parliamentary openness is something that we, we need to you know, talk about more and educate ourselves, uh, particularly because we, have, we are PMOs. You know? So it's, it's one area that needs, we need to develop our own internal capacity in and be able to engage. Beyond that, and also because we are focusing largely on the West African uh, continent, uh, West African region, um, what we've done, particularly in Ghana, in the implementation of our, of our project, was to identify champions uh, who are members of parliament to help champion the course of our objectives. And if we if we have we have if we are able to identify members of parliament within the various the various parliaments in the sub region, it opens doors for us. It's able to uh, make it easy for us to engage parliament and and be able to even monitor the work because if we don't have access, then it will be very difficult to to monitor the work of of parliament. So basically, these are these are some of the, 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 the best practices that we have documented. And I'll leave, I'll leave it for now and wait probably for the questions. Awesome, thank you so very much, Newton, uh, for sharing these ones for, 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 for us. And of course, the, the pioneering role of CDD uh, in, in this work across the region and the sub-region, uh, very, very uh, interesting. And the lessons obviously would inform us and, and uh, be applied going forward in the implementation of the Open West Africa project and beyond. Now, Caroline, your team at Mizalendo Trust obviously have been doing some amazing work in, 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 in Kenya. And of course, we are very much aware that, you know, uh, that amazing work is uh, moving across the East African region towards, you know, the efforts of um, convening and connecting uh, civil society organizations that monitor and engage parliament in there. Within the context of what you do at Mizalendo, and the Open West Africa project that has been introduced. How do you think that we all, as CSOs working together, can connect from our various regions on a more continental level to ensure that the goal of reaching parliamentary openness across the continent uh, is, is achieved? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sami. And uh, once again, congratulations to you and the team for the launch of this open uh, program. Um, I had Ben say that, you know, you're just uh, learning to walk. And I had Maria say that they are about 10 years. I would say then in that case, Mzalendo is the teenager in the room because we've just celebrated our 15 years um, of existence uh, this year. So in relation to the question that uh, you asked is perhaps I would start by giving a bit of background to the work that you have, that we've done. And um, perhaps what then brings us here. So as I've mentioned 15 years now of Muzalendo doing the work that we do. So in essence, we've been one of the, we were one of the first, um, or amongst the first PMOs to be set up in Africa. And in the course of that 15 years, I guess we have developed some experience. One of the things we, <clears throat> we did from the onset was a recognition that our relationship with uh, parliament needed to be twofold, collaborative in the sense that we would provide the access to parliamentary information, but we would also provide the technical support. But it also needed to be conflicted in a way, if you may, because if we were to advance the work of uh, parliamentary openness, parliamentary transparency, then there are sort of, there's some sort of work that 
we would provide, and that's the watchdog role, watching the watchers. And that's what something that we have done consistently, um, especially under the dispensation of the new cons constitution. A second thing to comment about is that um, the constitution of Kenya 2010 uh, perhaps has been one of our um, driving force because the constitution of Kenya is very clear in terms of its national values about the need for government and state officers to be transparent, to, to, to enhance public participation, to be open and in, 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 in relation to parliament itself, the constitution does require that parliament at both national and subnational level will be open and article 118 of the constitution re requires our parliament to actually one facilitate public participation, but to also be open and accessible. So that's a constitutional provision that we have been able to use. And of course, the third thing is that Article 35 of the Constitution provides for um, the right to access to information, and this was enacted into an act in 2016. So that this has been easier or, or um, created an enabling environment for work that might be better than exist in other regions. Um, another thing to mention before I, I get to the specificities of your question is that as Muzalento uh, Trust has been a key actor in OGP since 2011. So we were amongst the first civil society organizations to join the open government movement in Kenya. And the advantage of that is initially the first action plan, we were able to advance the work around the Access to Information Act, but we also um, centered legislative openness uh, built by the new constitution. We, we centered legislative openness in the OGP action plan. So in the last um, action plan, which was a third action plan, the Senate, which is uh, one of the two houses of parliament, and also the National Assembly were key actors in the national action plan. And that has continued also into the fourth national action plan that we are currently implementing. Why I'm saying this is because I know you've talked about the OGP work and I see in relation to your question, the advancement of OGP as one of the platforms that um, civil society organizations, PMOs in the continent can latch on to advance for open parliaments and to advance the question of parliamentary transparency. Um, and in this regard also, again, that collaborative effort. So we've, we've worked um, closely with parliament. So when we are doing the national action plans, we discuss with the, our counterparts in parliament and agree what are the legislative openness commitments that we want to see in the action plan. And then we agree on them and we discuss and we subject them to public participation and then we monitor the implementation. So in the current fourth action plan that um, Zalendo is the lead, um, our counterparts in the Senate are also the lead for the public participation and legislative openness commitment. Um, another way of working together and perhaps supporting each other now going to the regional level is um, peer learning. As I've mentioned, um, each, 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 each institution, each PMO um, in the continent finds itself at a different level of growth. So some of us have been here in the space for longer than others. And I think there are beautiful lessons to learn from each other. But there are also newer lessons to learn from um, partners who are uh, you know, coming into the space much later, because you come into the space where, for example, um, the level of openness is, is, is greater than it was before. Technological advancement is greater than it was previously. And therefore, there, 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 your, your, there are areas in which you're making deep dives that perhaps it's taken us a long time to get into. The other thing is, of course, um, again, mentioning <coughs> that same technology is that um, access, <coughs> access to each other. Here we are having a virtual forum, bringing together partners from Argentina. Um, your colleagues from Ghana will remember the 2014 meetings that required physical presence. And of course, uh, physical presence of uh, partners in Ghana. And of course that was faced with its own challenges due to lack of resources, 
and therefore limited the, the amount of um, engagement and support that we could provide each other. But now with technological advancement, it means that the, at, at the touch of a button at the uh, mobilization, even within a week or two, we're able to bring partners from South Africa, from Ghana, from Argentina, from Kenya, and share ideas and share experiences at more reasonable costs, less time, less travel, and therefore perhaps advance our agenda. And so this is something that I hope that across the different regions we can we can utilize, the, that the new normal um, can also be used to our advantage so that even as you are hosting your partners in West Africa and we are here from East Africa and South Africa and from Argentina, we are also able to do the same once we get to, our, to doing our own meetings. But most importantly also is that we can keep sharing these experiences, whether it's the, in terms of the platforms that you have mentioned, whether it's the Google Docs, whether it's through the research, um, and, and the, the use of social media. You, you'd be happy to know that, for example, for us at Muzalendo Trust, we always, um, uh, one of the things that uh, even speaking at a personal level, I, I love doing is just seeing how, you know, whether it's Zimbabwe, whether it's PNG, whether it's Odekro, whether it's um, other paper in Nigeria, just seeing how they are covering their parliamentary work and what they're highlighting. Uh, from parliament because doing so we then all learn from each other so utilization of social media uh, platforms I think is also one of the ways in which uh, we can advance our joint efforts as, as a community. Um, the other thing is sharing best practices so um, I know you've talked about the African parliamentary index and Maria has also spoken um, a lot about the Legislative Transparency Index. You may be aware that um, for us at Muzalento Trust, since 2014, we've been developing what we call an annual scorecard. And this looks at the performance of members of parliament using certain parameters per year, and we, we are then able to rank them. And so we are also interested in learning, but also in sharing our experiences on how we have used that as a tool to advance um, legislative uh, openness, but also, also create a linkage between the members of parliament and their citizens. Because like I said, if we are watching the watchers, it's then important to not just uh, see how the institution is performing, but how the members of parliament are also performing. Um, then finally is to also say that in creating these regional networks and uh, perhaps a continental network, I think the, the sharing of um, research, you know, will also be useful. Um, the level of uh, access to parliamentary information might not be at par in all the countries. So it would be interesting for us to learn from each other and you know, in terms of, for example, if you want to know how our committees have performed, and maybe in South Africa they've done something else on, um, you know, on committees, for example, which PNG is very good to, then another country is focusing more on the community, the, the constituency development funds, as we call them here. What is the best practice, and how is that information being utilized? What is the best practice in terms of engaging? Uh, uh, the, 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 the different parliaments, how do we enhance uh, that work? And then finally, let me just say something that um, a, a point of departure for us, obviously, is the fact that um, you are creating a network, but we are an institution so that focuses on, on some work, but cognizant of the, of the importance of working together as a network. We also have, um, in the last two years, been trying to strengthen what we call the civil society parliamentary, parliamentary engagement network, which uh, CSPEN. And this is meant to provide a linkage between civil society organizations and parliament. And what we do, whether it's in terms of um, legislative review, um, the technical support that you have spoken about, I think also Newton uh, spoke about, how do we support come so that it's not just being critical, it's also creating a forum where you can engage, where you can create some input 
into bills where you can share research. So um, in a nutshell, that's how we've worked, but that's also how I feel that we can learn from each other, benchmark from each other, share experiences, share research products, um, share the technology tools to exchange information and therefore advance the, the role and work of PMOs across the continent. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Caroline. Um, those are amazing. And, and yes, the experiences from your the civil society parliamentary engagement network uh, uh, in Kenya becomes very, very useful in even the efforts of um, how such similar networks get created in the West African region and to get them uh, uh, sustained. For those of you who are joining us online, uh, whether you are on the live uh, French translation or on the English translation, if you have any questions or comments, we encourage you to put it in the chat box. I've seen Robert's comments. Robert is from South Africa, UNDP, uh, yeah, no, UNESCO, uh, his comments on, you know, which goes to the effect of mainstream mean SDGs, gender and education related issues in uh, what is intended to be done so far as this project are, is concerned. If you are online and you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat box. If it is very necessary that you speak, please indicate by hand so I can monitor that because at some point the uh, this first session will have to go off for the online uh, participants because we'll have to end it. The in, 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 in country participants will have to take the second session and so please take note of that. Uh, but that will not be before we engage with our other uh, panel members. Rashad, uh, your organization, PMG, Parliamentary uh, Monitoring Group in South Africa, has over the years been part of the very, very uh, uh, leading pioneering uh, PMOs on the continent, doing amazing work and transitioning you know, over, over time. Uh, what do you think would be the benefits that comes with many years of working within this space, leveraging on that so that we can all benefit from it at the continental level, even as we try to come together with uh, the working group that we are instituting with our organizations being part of it and the efforts that are intended going forward, Rashad. Hi, colleagues, once again, I apologize for not having, uh, not being on, on, on the screen, but I uh, hope you'll bear with me. Uh, the disadvantage of going so late is that we've benefited from such rich inputs from my colleagues, and I was nodding quite vigorously in, in agreement um, with them. Um, I hope there isn't too much repetition on, on my end, but yeah, I just want to endorse um, all the comments made by, by my colleagues. Um, I think some of you are familiar with us as uh, with PMG as an organization, just quickly for the benefit of those who are not. Um, yeah, we've been around uh, the political, the, the landscape for since 1996 for, for quite some time. Um, we recognize very early on uh, the importance of parliamentary committees in that they are the forum for lawmaking, uh, that, that they are the engine room, so the forum for law, lawmaking, executive oversight and public participation and civil society realize um, that there's a great need for independent, unbiased, and consistently accurate and timely information about the workings of parliamentary committees. Uh, and this information was, not, was unavailable from, uh, from parliament itself. And so PMG was formed uh, from that basis. We've, uh, PMG has grown in scope over the years, and we now um, offer multiple services um, um, on our website. Uh, we believe that access to information is, is vital to citizens' participation in the democratic process. Uh, and for the past 25 years, uh, we've played an important role in facilitating that um, as PMG. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is aware that there's the, the a Zondo commission that's going on in South Africa at the moment that's looking um, at, at corruption that happened um, five, six years ago. And one of the key questions um, that the commission is trying to answer is parliament's role um, during that period of time. Where was parliament in terms of performing its oversight work? And so PMG as an uh, organization, we've been key to providing information to the Zondo Commission uh, with our systemic reporting on what happens uh, in those parliamentary committees over the, over the many years um, and, and parliament neglecting its oversight role. So PMG was able to compile evidential, evidential research and reports uh, to the commission. Um, 
and we, we also provided expert testimony to the Commission. And so we look forward to the Commission uh, finalizing this report uh, sometime this year. From our observations, um, there's a wide variety range of services and initiatives uh, undertaken by PMOs uh, internationally, from the most basic um, access to information, such as notification of what Parliament is doing, um, and then others that are doing more sophisticated work uh, with sophisticated tools um, and research and, and interface between MPs um, and the public. Um, however, in general, all PMOs aim to improve access to information about their parliaments. Um, yeah, and, and many also focus on the legislative process um, that, that's happening. Uh, the functions that each uh, M, uh, PMO chooses um, and undertakes is determined by, by the needs of their country, their resources, uh, and sometimes by the interaction uh, with the legislature and other organizations. Some of the challenges faced uh, by uh, PMOs include uh, limited access to information. Um, the next issue is translating access um, to translate, translating action, um, translating access to action. Um, although um, access to information um, is important, it shouldn't be seen as an end uh, in itself. There's a need to translate that into something useful. So that's something that we, we've grappled with um, as an organization over the years. Um, and it's something that we've been, we've been conscious of and, and mindful of. Uh, perception and resistance by parliament um, is also an issue. Um, there, there remains sometimes a degree of suspicion um, uh, about PMOs and the activities. And every five years as a new cohort of MPs come to the legislature, you need to reintroduce yourself and, and, and they need to become familiar with you as an organization and, and, and what you do. Uh, communication, I guess, is also uh, um, another issue. Um, PMOs need to continually ask themselves if they are reaching their target audiences um, and the need to reconsider the targets um, on a regular basis. Um, the other issue is uh, self-assessment. PMOs need to be honest uh, and assess the value of their services um, periodically. Um, while, you, while we were relevant maybe uh, 10 years ago, we need to ask, have there been developments um, over, the, uh, over the few years and are we still relevant, relevant um, as an organization? Um, in the last few years, um, PMG, we've become more strategic in that we're not just um, an information clearinghouse uh, of executive accounting to the legislature. We've con consciously increased our research output uh, where we provide data and analysis on the functioning of parliament with the aim of raising standards and strengthening um, the legislature. Um, we are also part of interim working group uh, that parliament established this year uh, for improving public and enhancing uh, public participation. So we are sharing our experiences and providing input in terms of parliament's programs and plans uh, and providing support in whatever way we can. Um, the one issue we've, we've discovered over the years is while a lot of our effort and work has been on the national parliament, we haven't paid much attention to the provincial legislatures or the, or the sub-national parliament. And so that is something that we're moving, uh, we plan on doing um, going forward. So parliament has made substantial progress in terms of being an open and transparent parliament um, it's not perfect, there's still a lot of challenges, uh, but com in comparison to what happens in the provincial legislatures, they are miles ahead, and that's something we need to be um, conscious of. Um, the other thing I wanted to raise, um, yeah, the nature of our scrutiny means that uh, we can sometimes be perceived as simply wanting to criticize um, or highlight any imperfections of political leaders. Uh, this sometimes can lead to misunderstandings. Uh, it takes time to forge credible and effective working relationships with, uh, with Parliament um, and MPs and um, the administration. Um, so that's something you need to be um, aware of. We are conscious that we need to provide information that is impeccable and defendable. Um, and so whatever we do, uh, we need to make sure that we, uh, we have information to back that up. Another way in which uh, poor per perceptions may be addressed is through education of MPs and the administration. 
um, and indeed also the public on the benefits of monitoring to society um, as a whole. Uh, good performance is also another positive factor. Uh, in South Africa, there is a broad recognition from um, committee chairpersons and many of the officials within the legislature who utilize our information um, and who are our cheerleaders and supporters. Uh, and because of that, we're able to, to get access and, and undertake that, the work that we're able to do. And so we have a lot of proactive engagements with the, with the staff. Uh, and researchers um, in terms of the work uh, that we do, as well as um, our civil society uh, partners. And yeah, I, I agree with um, Caroline's um, comments about the importance of having this hub uh, and that we will we, we'll be able to tap into um, various ex expertise, whether it's IT, other technical expertise, whether it's on communications and social media, uh, I mean, some of us maybe not, don't have IT um, experience. Um, we may be more on the political legislative side and part of our work involves um, uh, digital because we are a website. And so we might not have um, those IT expertise. Also, many organizations have tools that, they, that they, they, they're using, like Doseco seems like a very interesting tool. And as PMG, we might be interested in exploring that. And so it would be useful to engage with, with our colleagues on the continent, how that works and see what aspects of that tool um, we can perhaps uh, borrow and implement um, in this country. Um, and yes, often we do, um, comparative research is also important. Often we do research and would like to have um, a perspective from an African country. And sometimes that information is not ready, readily available online through online means. And so if our colleagues are able to facilitate or assist or provide insight, then that is uh, that would enrich whatever research um, uh, we're working on. Um, I guess it can also be used as a place to, to organize and uh, push for greater transparency. So if, if there are various countries or regions where um, they're still grappling with, with access and, uh, uh, and openness as a collective, we, that, uh, we can maybe write letters to endorse that and it might carry more weight um, coming from, from, for, from a collective. Um, and then yeah, continuous capacity building and peer learning, uh, yes, are important aspects uh, and elements um, of this. Uh, yeah, I think that's my contribution. Thank you, colleagues. Amazing. Thank you so very much, Rashad. Uh, we're grateful. And, and, and for your information, for those of us who are on the call, um, our respective organizations, Parliamentary Network Africa, uh, uh, PMG in South Africa, uh, Mazalando Trust in Kenya, the African Parliamentary Press Network, uh, and the Pan-African Parliament Civil Society Organizations Forum uh, have constituted some form of a working group that is going to, together with CDD Ghana, uh, working collectively to continue to advance this forward across regions, you know, so that these initiatives can be sustained and worked uh, uh, on effectively. For those of you who are on our on, who, who are joining us online, uh, like I announced, the online session will be going off in a couple of minutes uh, uh, because the second sec second badge for the online session will have to connect on another uh, a link for the next engagement, which is on private members legislation in Ghana. Uh, but before we do that, the our, our friends from the African Parliamentary Press Network, represented by Clement here, would give us you know uh, some quick perspectives on how the media sees itself connecting into this Open West Africa initiative going forward. Thank you very much, uh, Sami. Uh, we are very honored and privileged to be part of this open parliament engagement and networking uh, in West Africa. That's Open West Africa project. Uh, most of the time, the media is seen as an afterthought, but we are grateful that this one, we are part of the process. Uh, given that democracy is a form of government in which the supreme power is uh, vested in the people, the media becomes the eyes, the ears, and the mouthpiece of the people. So we expect that whenever we are going to do anything that involves the people, then the media must be uh, fully represented. And we are grateful that today we are here. In order not to talk plenty before uh, the real uh, show begins, uh, let me say that media, PMO, and parliament relationships, which we have now, this tripartite relationship is a very necessary one and crucial for the survival of democracy, which is uh, vested in the people. 
the supreme uh, power is in the hands of the people. So democracy needs parliament. Parliament needs the media, which is the eyes, the ears, and the mouthpiece of the people. And this interaction needs reflection and analysis to ensure that the right thing is done within the polity. And at a point in time, the media itself also becomes a PMO, that's a parliamentary monetary organization. Once this chain of command is there, that means that the media, the PMOs, and the parliamentary relationship must be sustained for democracy to survive. So this is what I would say for the beginning. And once again, we are grateful to be part of this particular uh, engagement. Thank you so very much, Clement. Uh, bringing in the angle of media, parliament, civil society relations as the tripartite kind of relationship that is necessary for us to be able to uh, uh, benefit immensely from what uh, is going on in, in, in the space. We thank you very, very much for those of you who joined us for this first session online from your respective countries. We are very grateful to you, Newton um, um, and Clement who have joined us in here, but particularly also to uh, you, uh, Caroline, um, to you, Maria, to you, Rashad. Of course, Bonolo was unable to uh, uh, make it because of her connectivity, but we'll continue to be engaging for Maria, uh, uh, Caroline, Rashad, and the rest will continue to be engaging. For those of us who are in the room, the opportunity allows us, you know, to take a few minutes to continue to engage on the subject matter. For those of you who are online, uh, this is where our uh, live television transmission for this particular one would, uh, 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 would, 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 would end. Um, we are grateful very much for, for, for your coming and we hope that we'll continue to engage on this going forward. We had a question come in from uh, Kweku Sechidanso uh, on media monitoring of regional parliaments. We'll be addressing that going forward in the subsequent session. Thank you all very, very much for the online uh, participants. We are grateful that you were able to make it. Thank you so much. Very well, so for those of us who are uh, um, in here, uh, please, this is the opportunity now that allows for a few contributions, uh, questions, thoughts, even as we prepare for the next session. As you may very much be um, aware, the next session, which is starting uh, uh, soon, uh, once the link is connected for the online persons to join that particular session also, will be on one year of Ghana's uh, parliament adopting a motion to allow for private members legislation and